Whew. All right, so um, I'm going to start with a couple of things. This is my first shop talk. Uh, it's also my first official brand innovators event. So thank you guys. I'm 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 really personally impressed with the level um, and quality of content. Um, I don't want to leave the room, uh, but I do recognize this is maybe not one of the most popular slots in the day. So we thank got half you guys. as many people as this morning. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you guys for um, for hanging out and being with us. So Clarice and I kind of got uh, thrown together uh, and. I kind of feel like we could have done the panel on Sunday night when we when we met to prepare. So that yeah, was super fun. I think we fun. went through everything just off the cuff and just had a lot to talk about. Yeah. So um, let's start with your your background and kind of the candy to to oral care story, which I love. Um, she had asked me kind of my, a little bit of my history, and I had to mention that I started out in the candy industry working with the Wrigley Company and um, worked at American Licorice after that, and shortly thereafter, I ended up in international business doing skin care and oral care. Um, it's kind of there where I kind of fell in love with the data and the clinical and the science parts of things, um, and so I ended up uh, in oral care there and then oral care with Chatham, working on ACT. And um, it's right about then when I started to realize people said, oh, you created cavities and now you have to pay your dues and you have to fix the cavities. And um, they're not wrong. I feel better about myself now <laughs> than I did 15 years ago. So. <laughs> OK, got it. OK, career change for guilt. There you have it. OK. Um, so as we started talking, um, and even when I first got the, the email to say, OK, you're, you're going to be talking with Motorpick, I immediately had a reaction to the brand, and the first thing that came to my mind was the sound. Uh, the sound that the water pick makes, and um, you know, my, my parents had one, so I, I obviously I know the brand. Um, we have several in our home, um, but tell me a little bit about kind of the advantages and perhaps disadvantages of being a brand that is perhaps like a a category founder because it's been a while. It's yeah. it's been around forever. Yeah, the first the first thing I'll nibble on there is uh, the fact that she she was polite about not calling it a jackhammer. Um, <laughs> you know, we definitely have improved the sound since your parents probably used it. So, um, but that's the sound of performance. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just remember mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, so. I, as far as um, the, the history of the, of the company and kind of where we're at, you know, it's, it's Waterpick's the founder of the company. I walked into a company that had been around for over 60 years and it was created by a dentist and an engineer, brother-in-laws, who got together and decided that they could do, you know, people a service by creating an oral irrigator so they could do that, do that at home. And so here we are and it's, you know, almost a, almost a half a million dollar uh, company. Um, it's, you know, a fantastic, it's not half a million dollars, sorry, a half a billion dollar company. Um, and it's just a fantastic product and it's, I think one of the unique things about it is Waterpick owns the category. I think one of the worst things about it is Waterpick owns the category. And so, um, you know, one of the first things I said, you know, to the company was, gosh, you guys are the Kleenex, you know, of tissues. Mm -hmm. And for better or for worse, we talked about being the Band-Aid of a category, right? Mm -hmm. And so with that comes a number of challenges, um, right. not when you are the only one in the marketplace for 55 years, but when you start to hit 60 years and the pandemic hits and the category takes off, which you've got is everybody else noticing and wanting a piece of that pie. And so now being the category term, it means that you don't have the equity behind it when there's competitors in there at half the price. So there's a new set of challenges that are posed by being that category leader and making sure that all of that investment you put into the category ends up with a conversion to a water pick and not somebody else. Yeah, so I, um, we were talking about that, right? Like you know you've made it when your brand becomes a verb. <laughs> And while we I'm might not go be, home and water pick, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I mean, I, this we didn't necessarily talk about this, but this came up in um, the uh, oh gosh, what, Harman, the Harman mm -hmm. um, thing about the you know kind of like the knockoffs, and and that's kind of what you were referring to just then, right? About um, searches on Amazon and and yeah. it's it's less like um, you know we have a. a 
another product within the Church and Dwight company that's called Flawless. And so what they'll get is a bunch of knockoffs. I actually was a victim of that myself where I went to go buy a Flawless product on the internet. Probably could have bought it through a brand store, but went and bought it on the internet and ended up with something that said Flawless, but it was made by a knockoff company. It wasn't the real deal. It did fall apart. It, it was not good. Um, we have less of that currently. It's not that we haven't been there and taken those down and stopped that. Um, but what we have is a lot of products coming from China that have found ways to be more cost effective. It's a whole nother fireside chat. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we're getting is a product that's half the price and a consumer says, well, water pick. It's, it's a water pick, right? And so they buy it. It's not a water pick. It's a water flosser by a company that wasn't created by a dentist and an engineer and doesn't have that performance. Um, in some cases, they are starting to have much better performance. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, we have to be very careful that the consumer thinks they're buying a water pick is actually buying a water pick and getting the promise. Yeah, OK. Um, so I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of the brand, because I think that that's really interesting. I want to talk now a little bit about what's happening right now. And one of the things that we've heard about a lot um, over the last 24 hours or so is the influencers. Yeah. And this is like super, this is, I am a mother of four Gen Zers. Um, I have one of them who is a D1 athlete, a female athlete. She's a pole vaulter. So when the um, American Eagle guy was speaking yesterday, I'm like, oh my God, can I, like a shameless plug for my daughter here. But, um, you know, she wants to be an influencer. And uh, yet, this is kind of, I kind of get, get your take on this. So uh, she wants to be an influencer, but when I asked her about how she buys and how she, how she likes things, she said, oh, mama, I would never buy anything from an influencer. And I said, what? And she said, if they're getting paid, I would never buy from them. And I said, well, but how are you, like, the, like, so there's one example, like Starbucks, a flavor, right? Mm -hmm. she, will, she will go for a, she'll get a flavor suggestion. But I thought it was interesting to me that that authenticity, she automatically associates that if they're getting paid, it's not an authentic um, endorsement, endorsement of yeah. the brand. And so as we talked about it, I said, well, then how are you, like, how are you buying, like, how are you choosing then? She said, if there's something that I like in the, in the content, and it, it's not mentioned, but I see it. And then someone else asks about it in, in a comment. Mm. And then the, you know, the creator will say, oh, well, these are, these are the glass, this is the brand of my glasses, or these are the shoes that I was wearing, but it, it wasn't the intended uh, ad, let's right. say. Right. So, sorry, that's a roundabout way to say, like, I, I'm fascinated by how influencers are being used. How are you guys thinking about, you know, taking a brand that maybe isn't the sexiest brand? I mean, it's, it's, it's not oral a lifestyle health, brand, right? Yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, it's a medical device for your mouth. So. Yeah, so, I mean, and like an influencer with a video on TikTok, like, what, you know, like teeth are kind of gross, right? Like people <laughs> don't want to like be talking about their mouths, right? So like, how are you guys thinking about using this? Yeah, I think it's interesting. So our core target is not Gen Z. So we don't necessarily have the problem of um, the scrutiny and the I want to see my authentic self in, in an influencer, right? And so it's it's not quite to that same level. What I would say is being a device is difficult when you're not a lifestyle brand, right? They're not going to see themselves in the brand, um, but they're going to they're going to learn from an influencer. So a couple ways that we have leveraged influencers for specifically for water pick. Uh, oral irrigators or water flossers has been um, both on the consumer and the professional side. So the professional side, I think, is one of the bigger keys, although we have ambassadors um, in the consumer as well. So starting with the professional, we have um, used a professional, like a professional educator. Um, a lot of them do our lunch and learns. And so they go into offices. And they're essentially an influencer for us. And it's not a salesperson. This isn't a sales pitch. Somebody who goes in who has a passion for the brand, they practice in office and part-time they go into offices and educate on water pick. And so they are essentially influencers for us. It's peer-to-peer -peer engagement. They're sharing information about the brand, information about how to increase your patient's oral health, how to increase that compliance, and direct them to the right product for them. This isn't about trying to sell them a product. Now, if they use the product themselves and they become a user, 
all the stronger of an advocate. That's where you really build that strong ambassadorship. Um, and so we do extend that into the social media platform where we are able to use some of the influencers in that are professional educators, hygienists, dentists, and have them talk about the product and use the product. And so it's educational through the social media channel as well. Um, and some of that will be uh, professional to consumer and some of that's peer-to-peer -peer professional. Um, but then if you also talk about it from a peer-to-peer -peer consumer, this is where we get really passionate people. Um, you have roughly 30% of somebody who uses a water flosser buying it and giving it away to somebody else. We have some of our biggest sales, whether it's a purchase um, like the other gentleman for themselves or if it's a pur purchase for a friend or family member that happens in that Q4 gifting time period. And so, you know, I think that's one, been one of the bigger ahas I've had this week, has been how do I better activate the loyalists and create more of those brand ambassadors and encourage that behavior. Okay, so one of the other threads that we, uh, we kind of talked about was the, the path to purchase and um, how maybe COVID really changed and transformed the path to purchase. Can you share a little bit more on that? We'll can yeah, I, I think we can all relate to this. I, you know, there's the dynamics, to, you know, whether you're on the brand side, the agency side, or otherwise, um, you know, things have changed and evolved in rapid fire. And I think for Waterpick, um, I've been with the company for about 18 months now, and so I kind of came in after the pandemic kind of hit. And I think one of the realizations we had is we probably need a new path to purchase study. The last one was from, I think, 2016. And so a lot has changed since then. And boy, let me tell you, a lot has changed since then. And so back then we were not only the only player in the category to the greatest extent, we had 95 plus percent share, um, but we also were mostly brick and mortar sales. Well, fast forward, over 60% of sales are done online now. Amazon's the biggest chunk of that. Consumers are now doing all their shopping online. And I think probably even the biggest aha I got from the path to purchase is that these consumers are not taking two, three, weeks, a month to actually get from spark to conversion, they're getting there in less than a week. And that's huge because all the things when you think about, oh, I need to educate them, the spark comes from the professional and then they go online and they go here and they go here. That's not indeed what the majority of them are doing anymore. And so that aha moment means we need to sit back and reflect on who exactly are we going after? What does that spark look like? And because they know what a water flosser is now, how do we engage them specific to water pick and, and end up following them to conversion? And so just a lot of ahas. And um, I think this is 2023, 2024 are going to be very dynamic years for the brand. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit more? I mean, I was thinking about the, the segmentation and, and the audiences. Um, how has that path to purchase the, the, conden like the condensed, yeah. right? Um, is that changing now? Like who the audience is, or it's just changing how you, how you market to them? I, I think it's all of that. Um, I would say that um, prior to even completing the path to purchase, we spent a lot of time last year better understanding that consumer. Um, we had spent uh, the majority of the, the life of the brand over that 60 years with professional marketing being the key driver of that spark. And so really understanding after that, you know, they go online, they do some research, they might go to the brand website and then go and purchase from a, a Target or a Walmart in person. Um, well, okay, now we're in a digital space and now we've been doing, you know, whether it's DRTV, linear, CTV for a handful of years, well, what does that consumer look like? Um, you know, who are we getting that wasn't professionally sparked? And so we did do segmentation work because um, we knew it was attitudinal based. This isn't like I know somebody in this market is more likely to go to a dentist. This is somebody who I either have a dental health issue, um, and so I've been sparked by the professional, or I have a dental health issue, I'm afraid of going to my, to my dentist. Um, and so I end up seeing a, a TV ad for Waterpick, and I look online and I you know, look for more information. And so we've got, I don't wanna share too much, we've got a handful of segments, two key ones, but coming out of the path to purchase, now we can create those shopper personas and better understand here's the mental state they're in, but here's where they're showing up and we need to be there and know how short or long that conversion is for that specific consumer segment. Okay, so um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go off of the, the, that, that piece for a second. Um, so sustainability has come up today. That wasn't so much um, yesterday, but I was thinking about this you know, over the last couple of sessions. I mean, 
water pick by nature is it like it's it's promoting sustainability. How much is that is that is that something you're using in your marketing messaging right now? We've had a lot of discussion about that. Um, you know, we're, we're part of the Church and Dwight Company. I think one of the things they do very well is being aware of what's important to the consumer, um, being aware of you know resources um, on a global basis that we can leverage and um, very much interested in figuring out how to be more sustainable um, and how to use that to be more meaningful with consumers in that space, even if it's only 16% of them. Um, but you know, I think one of the challenges we talk about a lot on the brand, um, Dan over here on my team is probably gonna nod to this quite a bit, is I mean, we do use water. So right, we're not a water conservation measure. But if you think about it a little differently, think about all of the floss picks you see, and you're, the next week you guys are gonna see them everywhere now that you're looking for them. <laughs> all of those little floss picks all over. If you are a flosser, less than 30% of people are actually flossers with any regularity at best. <laughs> but that's statistical, I'm not shaming. Um, <laughs> But you know, I mean, there's a lot of plastic involved in the little in the little containers and all of that that string floss, right? And so there could be quite a bit of an angle there. Um, I think we haven't we're working on it. We haven't quite tapped into how to effectively talk about sustainability when you have a hole to plug, right? So ups okay. and downs with that. Okay. But there's other ways we're approaching that that I can't talk about today. Okay. Um, I, I'm gonna, this was, we're going off script a little bit. The, um, so my, my purpose in life is to connect people and opportunities and ideas. And, and that's why I love partnerships. I'm passionate about partnerships. And so I'd love to kind of hear your point of view on like, how are you using partnerships, whether they're technology partnerships, um, product kind of partnerships. I, I truly believe that if it's like every brand should have a partner strategy for growth and if you don't you're leaving money on the table. Um, so one of the things I was thinking when Colgate was up here I was like why isn't there, uh, we were talking about the st sustainability factor mm -hmm. of like how they were condensing yes. things and I'm like why isn't there like a little Colgate drop that you can drop into the water pick and now you have that yummy Colgate taste and, and you've used the water pick. So anyway, sorry, that was my product idea. <laughs> um, but how are, you guys, how are you guys thinking and using partnerships? I won't say if the is or isn't in the pipeline. Okay. Um, I think that's a lovely not an idea. Not an original idea then. Okay. It's a lovely idea. Um, you know, I actually, Scope just came out with something, a concentrated mouthwash. It's something that when I worked on ACT mouthwash a long time ago, um, we had talked quite a bit about and the consumer adoption wasn't there, but the sustainability mindset also wasn't there. So I think there's, you know, it's at the right phase in the life cycle of that, that opportunity to be introducing those sorts of things. So I think we're there. Um, yeah, about a third of our consumers do actually add, um, and I'll get to your question, about a third of our consumers do actually add something to the reservoir for a more experiential benefit. Um, all you really need is water. Don't think like you have to add anything. It's refreshing, it's very effective. Um, but that said, partnerships are very important to me. And so I actually have spent the last six months honing in on you know, different partners we could possibly um, get together with where there's something mutually beneficial for the consumer that we can deliver. Um, that can be a technology, that can be an added benefit to the product itself. Um, and, and so there's lots of different ways to approach that. I think that's, that's critical to scale up and execute um, potentially quickly, it depends, um, with something that you don't have to start from the ground up. You just need to figure out how to bring the two together. So can't talk in, in much depth about that, but um, one of the things that's more tangible is we, because we are part of Church and Dwight, um, less than a year ago we acquired TheraBreath, fantastic mouthwash. Um, they're going head to head with Listerine in terms of category um, you know, leadership. So um, really fantastic product and one of the things we found thankfully is that um, Listerine has essential oils in it. You cannot use that in the water pick product. It doesn't work well with the inner mechanisms, the tubing and whatnot. So, um, however, TheraBreath you can use in the unit. So we've been working on cross promotions, working with our retail partners on end caps, other sorts of online co-bundling, right, virtual bundling opportunities. And so um, in the professional space, we have brought the brands together, but it's not just TheraBreath. It's actually Arm & Hammer um, in the toothpaste and the spin brush and oral gel. So in the professional space, lunch and learns, trade shows, um, we're bringing those together. Social media, both on the consumer and professional side, you'll see the hybrid there. Oh, that's a great example. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time. I think we're fine. But um, as you've kind of watched the content and stuff, um, what are the themes that like 
you know, if you're taking one thing back to your team um, or you're walking away with, what is, the, what is the one thing that you're kind of thinking about? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a word that you guys have heard a lot, but I'm going to put a spin on it because of how it's relevant to me, I would say, at Waterpeck. Um, and, and that's going to be the personalization. Um, you know, a lot of us are like, of course, personalization, but I think there's different ways I've thought about it since I've been here, different angles, um, and it kind of sparked some new ideas. Um, there was a conversation yesterday in one of the round tables where we talked about, um, I think it was Black Tux, it had said how they use the pressed, um, the steam pressing of their pants, right, in this short form, very tight lens uh, execution, and, you know, immediately I thought about, you know, the, the performance, right, of our product and the quality of our product, and that is a differentiator. And how can we bring that to life, you know, in some of this macro photography or video? And um, you know, what does that mean to somebody who has a dental health issue? How do you marry something in short content that this is a dental issue and this is the thing that helps heal, you know, create a benefit for that dental issue? And so, danced around heal. You have to be careful there. So, regulatory's in my ear. <laughs> okay. Um. I, I, I'm actually, so personalization, I think, I think that's interesting that you like, you've had a different spin on it. Um, what I've heard is like, I'm walking away with a human, mm. like there's been a lot of talk about humans connection. Um, I actually haven't heard the word experience as much as I expected to hear it. Um, experience transformation is what my company does. But you know, so many things go into that. I don't know. So I'm, I, I was, I think maybe selectively listening <laughs> for human too. But um, how, when, if if you think about the the human element, is there anything that you're taking away from that? That I'm going to spin it, and I'm going to say, okay. if you were to think about that in the context of water pick, what would your recommendation to me be? Well, I would think about what's the science of human behavior, and and the habits that we create, and like knowing that you know brushing your teeth is a habit um i would be going back to marketing to what the the human behavior is mm -hmm. um so i, I don't know i mean yeah, i think it's time. sticking to like the wh what the science is like what can we say if you're trying to um engage more of the the, cl the customers that you were talking about before like the high fidelity ones mm -hmm. um what are their behaviors so i'd be looking at those behaviors and then saying, you know, who, what, where else are you finding them? Yeah, I think that's that's really interesting. Um, so one of the segments she's speaking to is a much more oral care involved consumer segment, and so to them, having a healthy smile is important, and they're they're most willing to use products that they know will give them that kind of better smile and that confidence that they're being the best they can be in that space. And so, um, yeah, I hear what you're saying about that that experiential nature of it. We actually um, have have done quite a bit of that in the social space, mm -hmm. kind of highlighting those behaviors and associated in the water pick product with them. Um, I think there's bigger ways we can make that a part of, of the whole journey um, and letting them kind of see and feel themselves throughout each of those touch points along the way. So, Well, there's out. so many cool things we could do, right, when you think about the senses, right? So if you think about the human experience of using a water pick, right, there's the sound, there's the smell, mm -hmm. there's the feeling of clean teeth. So I really think there's a lot that you could be doing around that too. I would agree. See, now we have an ambassador over here. <laughs> so. um, okay, so kind of last thing that I've got. I don't know where we're, we're at, but okay. Um, what is the one product that Waterpick has that um, I don't know about, the people in the room don't know about, but we absolutely need to have in our house? I would say it's our Sonic Fusion. And so um, actually, Dan was on the team um, and, and co-led the development execution. What did it take, like 10 years to develop the Sonic Fusion, something like that? It took a long time just to get the organization to buy off. There you go. So there you go. But it's the world's first flossing toothbrush. And it is a fantastic product. And essentially, you have a lot of people out there who maybe they haven't even upgraded yet to a power toothbrush and they're considering it. Um, or maybe they have used one and it died, but maybe they're that enthusiast who wants to take that up a notch. Well, guess what? This, this product doesn't require you to have two different devices. You don't have to have your power toothbrush and a water flosser. It's all in one. And so it's just the touch of a button and you can brush your teeth, 
It has the timer for the two minutes, and then you can water floss, and you can turn that on and off, and so you don't have to change devices, nothing. And so it's, it's funny because we've been promoting this product for four or five years, and um, we talk about Sonic you know, Fusion or we'll go into a consumer group and they're like, I really wish, I really wish there was a product <laughs> where it was a toothbrush and a water flosser together. <laughs> and we're like, where have they been? We've been doing TV media for four years on this. Um, so yeah, I would say that that's you know, what we hear from people. Go, go on Amazon and look at the reviews. I mean, it's life changing okay. for people. So. All right. Awesome. Um, we can open it up for questions. Jason. Hey, this was fantastic. Um, last two days, I now have two items I need to buy, which is a water pick, and apparently everyone's trying to get me to buy an air fryer. So. Oh, you have to. Ha we'll talk about that later. Yeah, yeah you need one. Yeah, yeah. You I, do. I, I'm you coming. Do. I'm coming home to two purchases. Uh, so I have two questions to make it super easy for you. Uh, one is, you said Gen Z is not your target. I want to know why. And then the other is, how much are you looking into consumer insights that to understand what kind of foods people are eating mm. that influences? Because it sounds like it could be a really great behavioral insight. Uh, okay, so I'm going to hit that one first and then go back to Gen Z. So, um, you know, I, here's what I love. We actually have somebody who's newer on our team that, that helps out with social media. And when we were doing a, an influencer campaign a couple months ago, um, they brought something to me and they said, I'm not going to share how much you're going to like this, but you know, our brand new um, associate on the social team was like, I think this is really great. And they were like nervous and I couldn't understand why they're, so they showed it to me and essentially it's a gentleman who is a big food influencer and um, would go around and he went to, and ha to a Vietnamese restaurant and ate all this food and so they show him and he's, it's his shtick, right? He's a foodie, shows all this food and then he goes home and plugs up his sink and uses his water flosser and shows everybody what is sitting in the sink. And they thought I was gonna be like, you know, oh my gosh, I was like, this is amazing. Yeah. I'm like, we need to do more of that. And so um, I think it's less about is it steak or is it asparagus stuck in your teeth as much as it's the delight of getting things out of your teeth that you didn't even know were lurking there. And um, you know, there's, there's, there's stuff under your gum line that even your string floss isn't getting. And so, so that's how I would react to that and say that there's a, a fantastic space um, to talk about more about the food that's lurking in your mouth. Maybe not food specific, but what's left in your sink is very fertile territory. Um, it's, oh, it's satisfying, it's satisfying, it's delightful. Um, so then I'll, I'll hit on Gen Z. So um, Gen Z is not a core target. It doesn't mean that they're not buying water flossers. Um, it just means that we haven't chosen them as a core target. Um, their adoption of water flossers is more difficult. They're not gonna pay for the premium high quality brand because their need to enter into this space is much different than the need for somebody who wants that quality performance. And what do I mean by that? Gen Z does not yet believe that their teeth are ever going to fall out. You know, they go out and party all night, they might not brush for two days, it's, it's a-okay. Um, this is not the person who's gonna be using a water floss or investing $50 into something that they have to use a couple times a week, let alone once a day. Um, so for that reason, it's not a core target. Um, there's much more fertile uh, consumers that are based on mindset, not necessarily that kind of generational play. So, thank you. Awesome, any more questions? I was interested when you were talking about the positioning at the beginning, because you're, you know, you're the category creator, um, but it's medical device, it's, maybe it's not like quite as luxurious, whatever. Um, are you more interested in steering into like the, like that premium price, premium margin, premium, you know, like a, um, our friend, our friend earlier from Colgate, for example, Hills Pet, Hills Pet is like always wearing a lab coat, right? It's the functional, high cost, high quality food, you know, kind of thing. Um, are you more interested in steering into that territory or are you more interested in steering into a more demographic, you know, like kind of a more democratized category in terms of price point and everything like that? Yeah, um, I would say that, you know, what we do is, is rooted in high quality 
highly effective products that consumers can trust. And so uh, we do not want to stray from that by offering cheap products that make them wonder whether or not it's going to be as effective as what they, they hear from their dentist or from a peer um, from those other ambassadors. So we want to be very careful about maintaining that kind of premium image um, and delivering up upon that promise. I would say that the um, challenge we have is given the last six to eight months and what's going on with the economy, uh, consumers want to enter the category. They can't justify entering the category, right? They might buy some Nikes, but we're not a Nike, right? So um, I think that's where the pressure lies, is how can we be more affordable without sacrificing the quality and the promise of the brand? Um, I would say that high, higher end, more premium offerings, um, a little more gadgets and gizmos and what's not, um, is certainly something that, that um, is core to our future. Um, it helps position us as the innovator in the category and keeps us as that number one. Um, but right now, today, might not be the best place to play, given the way consumer behavior is. Okay, great. Anything else before we close out? One more in the back. Little hustle. Hi there, this is Ron from Resonate. Uh, you mentioned that you've had the epiphany that uh, you have this strong gift givers segment. Um, and then you also mentioned last night at Topgolf that the average shelf life of your product is five years. So I am in your gift giver segment, right? I bought my mom a water pick like five years ago. Did you get her to use it? Oh yeah, she loves it. But when it broke, <laughs> she didn't buy herself a new one. Like I had to like, go and gift her again. So it was an easy Mother's Day present, right? But You're an enabler, but I appreciate yeah, that. No, it was just, it was it was wild to hear you say that. But I'm wondering, so uh, are you currently targeting gift givers? Like, do you have that ability to do that with uh, your data set now? It's a very big opportunity that we haven't effectively capitalized upon. We have done it to some extent, you know, some of the CRM tactics and email and whatnot. Um, we haven't done it in a big enough way. And so um, definitely a lot of the conversation the last two days came back to reinforcing, maybe this is one of those insights sitting on the shelf that we need to kind of bubble up a little bit, especially in Q4. We do put tags like, you know, makes a great gift and that sort of thing. We do focus around some of those time periods. Um, but I think we can do a lot more to activate those potential ambassadors. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think that that wraps it up. Okay, Sonic Fusion. Sonic Fusion. Sonic Fusion. Flossing right. toothbrush. Yes. Water right. pick. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks.